Hallelujah. Because the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. Right. And that's that's that right there had me kind of like baffled a little bit, like, okay. That the, all those times that I would read this scripture, I would never even trip that it was a I just now realized that it was a vision and that it wasn't actual, like literally happening. He said, he brought me a bit out of the spirit. He said, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit. Ex in the spirit. Exactly. And set me down in the middle of the valley. Exactly. He literally picked his spirit up and put him in like a vision, like a, like a supernatural, like, I don't even, it's like, I can't even explain it. I try to imagine how it was like, for him. Like how but that's but, but yeah, 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 oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, just like the movie. But that's but that's exactly that's exactly. That's but that's yeah. But that's see. But that's exactly what we're what we're what we're talking about. Is that the key? The key, and I was just going to say that, and that's the key, mother. It says that the hand of the Lord was upon me. And it said, and like she said, it carried me out. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the of the Bible, you will find. I mean, the beginning of Ezekiel, he had another vision, and also I believe it's in chapter eight. He had an he had another vision. Uh, chapter eight was when he had a vision, and then the Lord came to him and took him to the temple. Mm -hmm. um, remember, and then we had the preachers in the temple who weren't doing the will of the oh, Lord, yeah. and they were hiding, and they were all that other kind of. All that other kind of stuff. Yeah. But so, and then to answer your question, um, let me see here. And he said, well, yeah, because we want to get into this. And he said, he's, verse 11, verse 11 is the key. He says, then he said uh, unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Hmm. So then that answers the question right there, right? Because He's saying that these bones are now the whole house of Israel. And it says that, behold, they say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We are cut off. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, 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 we are cut off for our part. So there he is indicating that the reason why he had the vision is because of how they felt they felt that they, their hope was lost, mm -hmm. right? And they were cut off. So it, we, we see it as a vision that he's talking about the, the dry bones. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna get a little bit more into that. Um, what are some other themes that we see? We, um, I've, already to, we, I've, uh, I've already told you one in the text, hope. I think that there's also a restoration. All right, restoration. Expound, please. Because he's going to bring the bones back. Well, I want First Lady to expound <laughs> on <laughs> restoration. Mother tried to help you out. Help, mother, help. Ex ex expound, please. <laughs> Because he's going to bring the bones back to life. <laughs> no, but, but really the restoration of Israel as the as the for them to be able to have their their rightful place. Mm -hmm. So basically they're gonna, you know, through their time of tribulation and judgment, which is what we've seen them going through mm -hmm. now, but God is gonna restore them back and uh, they'll be able to have the temple and everything that was promised unto them. And so he's he's going to make their nation great again. Uh -huh. Amen. 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 All right. Okay. What is another? What is another thing? Um, he's going to unify the children of Israel when he says together um, the four winds of the earth. And breathe life into the bones. That's him implying that he's going to gather all of the Israelites that have been scattered in all the different countries and nations. And, he's um, unity. I like that. I like that. Um, yeah. Come on, keep expounding, sister. And then how he talked about the stick. Told Ezekiel to write on the stick. Um, 
I hate to write the name, to write the two. Um, Meaning no more of the two, can, like, with the the two mm -hmm. they will no longer be separate. They're going to be one like they were intended to be. Right, I'm pulling, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, yeah, so Judah and, Judah and Joseph. Ephraim. It said e Ephraim, mm -hmm. but it's talking about that talk stuff. About, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 go, go. I have. I'm sorry, but I can do that. No, you, 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 you I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I do that like I tell people, I'm like, I, I need to work on that. Like, it's it's, it's all good, sis. Team said. He said he took a stick, he wrote on it for Judah mm -hmm. and the people of Israel associated with them. Mm -hmm. And it says, then another stick, um, then he took another stick and wrote on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with him. Okay, so in verse 16, what do we hear? We hear Judah, and then we hear Joseph. Mm -hmm. But he's bringing the lineage. Back yep. together. He is. That family. So the discord and with all of the fighting and mm -hmm. everything that's going on, he's bringing peace. He's bringing peace. So that's another thing. Peace is another thing. Yes, it is. We have restoration. We have restoration, mm -hmm. hope, and we have peace. Okay. Mm -hmm. And unity. So now, but well, let's get some history now on the unity. Now, there was Ephraim, that, that, that lineage. Remember, when the children of Israel were going to the promised land, were there any people that stayed on one side when they crossed the River Jordan? Or did everybody cross over? Or were there people that were... There's some people that didn't cross over. Exactly. Right. There were some people that didn't cross over. Mm -hmm. But then those that did cross over, there were some that they split. So they had what we call a northern kingdom kingdom and a southern kingdom. They mm -hmm. split. Mm -hmm. Right? Because remember, David was king over uh, a smaller territory, mm -hmm. and then he became king over the whole house of Israel mm -hmm. and united as one king. That's why he refers to David. Oh, yeah. As, yeah later on in the text. Yeah. In the text, he refers to David. David. Will be the king. Right, because David started out to be king in just one city for a few years, right? Then he became he king, I believe it was over Judah. Then after that, he became king over the whole children of Israel, right? And so when he says, you know, my son David, right? David ruled over the whole embodiment of the children of Israel. So it's like he's showing Ezekiel future but past, right? It's but a David's already gone. And but dead. remember, when he's referring to David, he's referring not to Jesus. Thank you. He's referring to the Messiah. Why does he talk to, say it like that? Though? Because remember, Jesus came out of the lineage. I know, but why don't he just say that? Why does it say that? That's what we have to ask him. <laughs> I already got that nugget about that mom. When he said David, he's talking about the seed of David, the lineage, at which would be Jesus. Well, why does he? Why you do that? Like you see why a newcomer or like somebody who's like new but would because, be confused? Because but because in Ezekiel um time that's still old testament, so all they knew was Oh, okay. Stay there, thank you. All oh, they knew yeah. was they knew. I didn't think all about that. Yeah. 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 They that's didn't know. True. That's true. Okay. And the word like Jesus. Yeah. Okay, okay, that makes sense. All right, there you go. That's Mark, what I was there. Oh, give me that. Oh, oh, give me this. Well, we're friends with Todd, so we're like, it's, it's, it's all about Jesus. Uh -huh. That's true. But we have to put ourselves in the mind. Okay, in that time, this is what was going on. One of the things that I try to do when I'm studying this, I like to, I want to put my, immerse myself, like you're saying, in that time understand the rules and regulations that I can understand the best of my ability of that time. Mm -hmm. So when we are reading it, when, I'm, when we're studying the text, we're not studying it from our perspective, but from how they would have viewed mm -hmm. what was being said. So then now we can take biblical truths of what is being said. 
But the good thing, though, is is the fact that to be able to make the connection, though, David, you're talking about King David, okay, but Jesus came from the lineage of David. You know what I mean? So being able to be like, hold up now. Because normally, I mean, think of how many times we read that scripture and took it out of context yep. and everything else mm -hmm. and don't even and really skim over the fact yep. that he's talking about that David's even included. It's just yep. like, okay, but the bones is going to get locked again. <laughs> right, and that, and Talk to your bones. Right. Tell your bones. Tell them dry places. Mm -hmm. That ain't even right. right. <laughs> but, but see, but see, and, and, you know, and like I, I was just telling them, I, I've done the same thing myself, right? Because when you read it, at first, you know, I said, you know, when I first read it, this is literal. He's talking about a valley. So it's a word judgment. But it's talking about a valley. The only thing that's literal is sin and salvation. <laughs> um, everything else. So, so. Okay. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just. Because we're not going to get stuck on this point right here. The only literal thing is sin and salvation. Take it. Move on. Thank you, man. <laughs> we moving on? Because we gonna get because because we like look we gonna move on because we gonna get stuck right there for the whole Bible study. I want you to preach that one. <laughs> so we have this question here. This art art that I got from Logos. I didn't do it. I got it from Logos. I downloaded it. Uh, <laughs> so he says, and he says to me, Son of Man, can these bones live? And he answered, oh, Lord, you know. Um, so this is something I, I, you know, it came to me. Um, this is, has anybody heard of Charles Spurgeon? Mm -hmm. He is uh, very known for his writings. He was a pastor in the 1800s. So you could type up Charles Spurgeon. And a lot of theologians and a lot of scholars, they, they like his writing. So he's a very, very well-respected writer, uh, preacher um, in that time. And, and I think it was in uh, overseas in uh, Europe area. I, I don't know the right, the correct location. But anyways, Charles Spurgeon says, this is his quote, and I, I will uh, get the exact quote, but I'm paraphrasing it because I read it this day. So yesterday, and I said, man, this is good, it's powerful. So he says, that when, whenever you're dealing with a dead church, the only way to revive a dead church is to speak the word. Mm. When you speak the word, then the church should be revived. Mm. This is what Charles Spurgeon is saying. And it's, it's interesting because we have this picture of the bones and we have this picture, this question, can these bones live? And we understand that it is a vision was in the beginning he had ezekiel had a vision uh chapter eight i believe he had another vision chapter 11. there's numerous there's numerous chapters in the book of ezekiel that where he's saying that he's had a vision and 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 in that we see that each vision represented something but in this vision he's he's asked the question can he live now in that time they were folk and i don't want to get ahead of myself but in that time they were folk that hadn't seen resurrections because verse 5 it says thus says the lord god uh you know uh to these bones behold i will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live mm -hmm. which which causes us to understand that if we want anything from the lord right his word will give us breath it will give us life we're going to talk about that in a little bit his his word the breath of god is going to signify life to people that are that are dead or that are dry, right? He's gonna give us life. And to go back to the first point about what Charles Spurgeon is saying, he's saying, and, uh, and I, I hear it ringing in my head to 2017, is that there's a drought for the word. Because anytime you preach the word of God in its context, it should have a revival in those that once knew the word that have gotten away from it. Yeah. And two, those that have never heard the word, it should, prick them into being interested in what the text is being saying because his word gives life yeah. our word doesn't his word is what's going to give you and i life it's going to give us the spirit that we need to move on 
Remember, Adam didn't come alive until he there was breath in his body, until he breathed on them. These bones didn't come back alive until breath was in them. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think about this as we go into the intro. Think about uh, 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 bones. Now, some some commentary says that this bone was so dry they were bleached by the sun. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. So they were just so they were so dry. Now, I want you to think about this. They went through the rigor mortis stage, right? Mm -hmm. The decomp stage, all of this other kind of stuff set in, and these bones are just completely dry. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he sees these bones come back together, mm -hmm. right? However, bones stay together, they come back together. That's an amazing in its in itself. The bones come back together. Then he literally sees the skin cover the mm -hmm. skeleton and the muscles and the tissues and the blood. Mm -hmm. But now. The people look like they're asleep, but they haven't become alive until the breath of God has now entered into them to bring them back to life. Wow. Right? So that's exactly how the children of Israel felt. And I'm already in my intro. Mm -hmm. That's how the children of Israel felt. They felt yeah. that they were dead like those bones. Mm -hmm. They felt like they had no hope. Because they had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, they had been the Syrians they had been destroyed. They had, uh, you know, Egypt trying to get with them, Tyre trying to get with them. Right? Remember, all of these countries threatened them and all this other kind of stuff. So they're now feeling abandoned and they're left for they're dead. Like they're being treated now. Like they're being treated now, right? So here's the thing: He's telling us that you know what? I'm going to restore their hope. I'm going to bring them back to reality. I'm going to change the way that they think. I'm going to show them what was one of the key things. And they are going to know that I am their God. That I am their God. So they're going to know at the end of the day who I am and what I'm capable, capable to do. Go ahead. Say what you got to say. reading that and being an Israelite, like actually reading these scriptures and seeing that he's like, wow, he's talking about me. Like he's talking about the Israelites. I know I'm a Gentile. But I'm like, I wonder how they feel about that. Like, do they ever? Some of them rejoice. Some of them, you know. You know what? I feel like I'm just like. <laughs> I, I know. I know right? I'm like in a like. I know that you know. I know it's not there, but it's like no. Once we in the Christ, we adopted into the. the right. That's why we're like grafted in. So I'm like, essential, <laughs> right. So we're part of the promise now. So I'm adopted in. So yeah. I know that. What do you think about that? I thought about that too. <laughs> I'm moving on. We'll talk about that later. Well, he always goes away from that. I'm adopted. Yeah, because we don't even really know. Because they matter like the Bible says. The Bible, here we go. I feel my tongues come directly from the land of Israel. No, I'm moving, really I'm I'm here with Susanna. I do. The scripture, I'm going to say this and we'll move on. The scripture says that all Israel is not Israel. Is that scripture? Yes. Yes, it is. Where is it at? Okay, I don't know, but I know it's a... <laughs> I never heard it. It's in Romans. <laughs> you are not just playing. All Israel is not Israel. Okay. You are not... Expound. Expound. What that, what, that, what that means is is that even though you may have a bloodline of an Israelite, does that mean that you're entitled? No, you know, to 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 you have some Israelites that don't believe in God. That's true, right? So just because I have a name of an Israelite, does that mean that I'm entitled to the blessings of Abraham because I don't believe? You have Pharisees. You have Pharisees who were Israel. Jewish who questioned the deity of God. Mm. Even though they were waiting for the Messiah, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. All Israel is not Israel. In other words, everybody that has the bloodline doesn't mean that they're part of the true body of Christ. I'm going to leave it at that. In the Old Testament, we see that death in most of the... Death in most of the Old Testament was viewed as an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. So, 
they didn't see people being raised from the dead. They didn't see resurrection happening. But there are scriptures that let us know that resurrection did happen. And we'll talk about it in a second. The first idea of a bodily resurrection could have developed as a natural culinary to Hebrew views of anthropology. Human beings were considered living souls. That's the Hebrew word nephs. So one of the things that you have to understand is in order for God to raise these bones, when a person dies, they are, they're, they're, they're disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. they're, there's nothing in them that lives. Their soul is not in them. We'll get to that in a second. As such, human being were, was a, a unity rather than a, a dichotomy or a trichotomy in Genesis 2 and 7. After, after, it says, at death, the physical body and the life-given breath are separated. So the spirit, in this case, will be ruha, because it's being, it, it's being uh, synonymous, right? The life-given breath, the spirit of God, is separated from the physical body when a person has passed away. Uh, Job tells us, Psalm tells us, Ecclesiastes speaks about it. And any hope of victory over death will require the reunion of the physical body and the life-giving seed to them coming back together. This is what Christ did. He separated himself from the life-giving breath, then took the life-giving breath back into the physical body and raised from the dead. This is what he did, right? He is one of his kind. Because the Bible says nobody lays down his life. He laid it down on his what? On the core. So he was able to take the life-giving breath out of his physical body, keep it on the rafter for three days, then pull it back and put it back into the physical body, then come back in physical nature to let you know that I have conquered over death. Wow. I, man, I feel the anointed on that boy. Man, I'm tired by it. I'm tired by it. But this is what this means. When a person physically dies, right, they are separated from the life-giving breath. Even a sinner has a life-giving, which is called a seed. So this is what Ezekiel saw in the dry valley of the dry bones. He saw the reunion of the life-giving seed to a physical body that was deemed dead. My God. So the second resurrection of human beings was not totally a new idea. Both Elijah and Elisha had been involved in the resurrection of individuals who had died. When none of these compared to what Ezekiel saw in his vision, they do represent two earlier prophets as being instruments of, of the breath of life. Now, one of Eli Elisha or Elisha, I just call him Elisha too. But one of the things that we see about Elijah, number two, the second one, is that remember, he had been dead, and, they, and a man had passed away, and they threw him into the same hole where he was in, and then he came back to life and crawled out of the pit. So, in other words, he was physically dead, and the life-giving breath was separated from him, but when it touched the anointed bones, the life-giving breath came back to the physical nature of that person, and he was able to rise from the pit. One of the things that you ought to understand is, is that when Jesus died, what happened? No, what happened in the community? Oh, all that. Um... <laughs> when he committed his soul to on the on, he was on when the he was on a cross. What happened to earthquake, right? And what happened to what happened to some of the stuff in on the side, like some of the people or the graves? Oh. Didn't some people? Didn't some people come back to life? Okay, let's let's go get you the text. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it should, but I never knew that people came back to life. I'm gonna get it right now. Dang, I got a lot to learn. We all got a lot to learn, sister. I should have known that. 
Sometimes I get scared that you're going to be like, this part for me, I never knew. You already know. Oh, no, stop. No, That's right, man. Like, what is he going to say? You know, no. you got to know your words. You're here. He's fine. All right, I'm getting it right now. I'm going to get you the text. You know, I'm going to pull the text out. Amen. That's what Bible study is for. That's what we learn. That's how they missed that one. Yeah, Matthew, that. Matthew, let's turn to Matthew let's, let's turn 27. Let me get my, my Bible. Matthew 27. And then it's going to be verse, I think, 50 or 52. Uh, 50, I think it's 50 tombs went for this to okay. come up on there. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Mm -hmm. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Can you imagine? I got chills on my legs because I never even knew that. So what happened when he died? They the, came tombs. the tombs opened, and what happened? Those who have fallen asleep, which back when in the Bible, fallen asleep. Read, read, read it one more time. I think from, I think it's 50. From 50? Which, which it I'm says. From 52. So. Let me go back more. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the. Stop right there. So he yielded up his spirit. He what? He passed away. Yeah. He yeah. yielded up his spirit. 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. From mm -hmm. top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Mm -hmm. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they they went, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Stop right there. Ooh. So when he had passed, as soon as he passed, there was an earthquake. Yeah, but oh, that said, but that said after his, his resurrection. resurrection. So I mean, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. It was after. His resurrection. So after, he, after the third, third day, when he came back from um, Hades or Hell, where he took the keys and everything, when he came back up, when he resurrected, then that's when they came. That's what it says that when Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded his spirit, right? He yielded his spirit, and behold, the curtains were torn from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the tombs were open. It hadn't he hadn't resurrected yet. But it just said the tombs were open. Before. Yeah, that says that many bodies of the saints who have fallen many many bodies to the and coming out of the tombs after his after resurrection. resurrection. Okay, after his resurrection, I didn't hear that part. Yes, but but that's the thing. Yeah, it's still the same, still the same thing. thing, right? So she's keen on the resurrection, so that but that's key. So right, so here's the thing, right? It's the same. It's the same. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. People who have fallen asleep, we know those are people that are saints, like the scripture says, they had fallen asleep, then their physical body had been separated from the spirit, and now they're rejoined together. And I believe that those were testimonies of the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. I believe, and this is just me, I believe that they were witnesses because it, it, it goes to Jesus' credibility. Yeah. That he is the only one that can bring saints back up. Mm -hmm. And now they're going out to their families. And these families know that these people have been passed away for yes. some time. And he's going back and now witnessing to them. Here it is that he is trying to reunify the body of Christ. And Ezekiel is seeing this. He is seeing the reunification of a spirit and his spirit in the physical body. And this had happened in Ezekiel's day. I mean, in uh, Elijah's day, where the person with Elijah, we don't know, I don't remember how long Elijah had been passed, but it, it really doesn't make a difference because the man was thrown in there and he came right back up. It's the same thing. The Spirit of God is connecting. Mm -hmm. That's. This, you just can't. But that's still, but that's still the civilization. Of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, though, too, because until we are filled with the Spirit, we are walking dead. Uh huh. You get you get ahead of my text. You didn't read the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. 
that's the truth because now you you woke that's, that's the, true that's what kids say now now you woke mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but, and, that, and that's something that we need to we can't take for granted right that we are now alive in the things of, in the things of god yep. that's what this whole thing is talking about it may not be pointing to a specific resurrection but it's pointing to a national resurrection mm-hmm. Right, the nation, the Israel, he's bringing them back together. So it, it's put into that. Now, one of the things that we have to understand in this text is there's another theme, his promise. So I'm going to tell you why. Deuteronomy 28, 15, it says, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, or be careful to do all of his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And this Ezekiel is really, we can, we can see him highlighting 25 to 26. He says, the Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. Mm-hmm. Check. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. Check. And you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Check. 26. And your dead bodies shall be food for all birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. Now, Israel in that time was supposed to have a proper burial. But because Ezekiel walked among the valley of dry bones, it signifies that, number one, well, we indicated they've been, it's been in the sun, which means that they were food Mm-hmm. For the birds, it symbolizes that this, and there were really real corpses out here that have been defeated and really laid out like this mm-hmm. because of how they did not obey the voice of the Lord. So, even though they had lost their confidence in God, it wasn't God's fault that this happened, it was, it was because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, mm-hmm. they stopped. Obeying the voice of the Lord. And one of the things that we ought to see here, just another side note, is that whenever you see Lord like this in caps, it is still representing uh, the deity of God. And when you see Lord and you see everything else, lowercase, it's not rep- it's rep- it'll represent master and ruler. Mm-hmm. When you see Lord in all caps like that, it doesn't represent, it doesn't represent ruler, it represents really the deity of God. Remember. Mm-hmm. It, exactly, it's Yahweh. It's, repre- it's really representing the deity of Him, right? Because remember, some Jews they didn't want to say His name that much. Remember, they wanted to reverence His name. So that's what you see here. They're still reverencing His name. They knew it was Yahweh. They didn't even want to say it. That's why they said Lord, but they have it in caps for a reason to still reverence the deity of God. So it's still. That God, and I just wanted to kick that in there since we've been talking about that. But yet, they, their bodies were food because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. If they would have obeyed the voice of the Lord, then they, all this other stuff in 28 of Deuteronomy wouldn't have uh, uh, applied to them. But some, this still uh, applies to us. We need to be obeying the voice of the Lord. So, God is a keeper of his promise. It's another thing. His promises are yea and amen. Mm-hmm. So he will keep his word, whether we like it or not. He kept his word. This is what I'm going to do to you. The book of Ezekiel is built upon, the first 24 chapters is built upon Leviticus and 28 and the rules that they did not follow. Yeah. So now, now we talk about the significance of Emmanuel, which is God, Emmanuel, with us. God with us, right? So God is with his people. Oh, this is going to be good. Genesis 28, 15 says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Exodus tells us 33, 14. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. 
Numbers 14 and 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. God with us. And this is really ring a bell because what we've been talking about on Sunday. Amen. Right? This text signifies the significance of Emmanuel, God with us. He has always been with us. Genesis tells you he's been with us. It says that God dwells with his people. Revelation 21, 3. And it says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be them, be with them as their God. So he's not only saying that he's going to be with them, but he's going to establish that he is their God. Ezekiel 37, 27, coming from our text. It says, my dwelling place shall be what? With them. And he says what? I will be their God. And they shall be my people. See the connection? Emmanuel, God with us. Yes. He's already showing us that the Christ is coming to be with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, help me. So then Jesus Christ is always with his believer. Here it goes in the New Testament, confirming. It says in Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It's God speaking to us right now. Man, wherever you feel like, wherever you think you are in your life, God is still with you. He's been telling us that since Genesis. I will not leave you. He even, he even said, I stripped the hand of the power of the enemy. And I gave you the victory before you even knew it to let you know that I'm with you. Watch the, the text. What the text say? It says, "Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people who live, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed. It's gone. There are some fights that you don't even have to fight." God removes something out of them so that you can win and have the victory. Because he's what? With you. His spirit is always with believers. By this we know that we abide in him and he is in us. Because he has given us what? His spirit. His spirit is not only around us, but when we receive the power of the spirit, the Holy Ghost on the inside, he is now within us. Ezekiel 36 said that he was going to give us a new heart and a new spirit, and that he was going to dwell within us. Mm, mm, mm. Now we look to the activity of God. God is active by nature. Praise by nature. Now, <laughs> God is not passive or remote from his creation, but dynamically involved in all that he has made. In the past, this activity was seen in history of Israel and in the midst of Jesus Christ. In the present, God's activity can be seen in the life of believers and of the church. His name reflects his activity and involvement with his people. Genesis 22 and 14 says, the Lord will provide. Exodus 15, 26 says, the Lord who heals. Exodus 17 and 15 says, the Lord is my banner. This title emphasizes that God is like a warrior who champions his people cause. Psalms 95 and 6 says, the Lord our maker. The Hebrew word you use does not refer to the original creation, but to the way in which God is fashioned, fashioning a people for himself. He has been active all along. 
They would tell us God is dead. He's a lot. Yeah, y'all a liar. He ain't dead. He's alive. He's always been active. His word. I am streaming. It's on, it should be on YouTube. Um, if not, um, check. I send you guys an email. You can just send the link from your email. But I am streaming on YouTube. His word is active. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. The Hebrew word for word can be translated as deed or action. God's word is not merely a communication of abstract truth, but a powerful force active in the world. His word is a powerful force that is active in the word in the world. Isaiah 55, 10, 11 says, for as the rain and snow comes down from heaven and do not return there, but the water, but water the earth. Make it, make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. In your translation, it would say that his word will not come back void. You guys heard that before. His word won't come back to a void, right? It's going to accomplish exactly what it's been designed to do. His word is active. Ezekiel 37 and 4. Then he says to me, prophesy over these bones and say to these bones, oh, dry bones, hear what? The word. And it say, hear my personality. It said, hear the word. He is the word. Jesus is the word. Ha! Hear the word of the Lord. The basis of assurance. Assurance is based upon the certain knowledge of God. The assurance of believers is based upon the certain knowledge of God. Uh, of God revealed in creation and his mighty acts in history upon certainty of his promises, the vindication of the resurrection of Christ, and the inward testimony and outward demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, his spirit. That's what this is, the demonstration of the inward testimony and the outward demonstration. But assurance now comes from knowing God through creation. Romans, Romans 1 and 19 and 20 says, For we can be known about God, excuse me, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invis invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of this world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Assurance comes from knowing God through his mighty acts. Uh, Exodus 6 and 7 says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out of, uh, who, excuse me, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And here's that thing. And I am your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It's in Exodus. In Exodus, I mean, Ezekiel 37, in our text, it says, And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves. Wait, let's stop right there. Didn't the Lord, when he resurrected, open the tombs? They were to know that he is God. <laughs> ah, God. Then he says, what? I will put my spirit within you, not around you, but in you. And you shall live, right? Because the word is alive. And I will place in you your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. Man. It don't get no, exactly, it don't get no clue to that. We see this in Exodus. And you shall know that I am the Lord. We see it in Ezekiel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. It's almost like he's saying, like how many times, just like when Jesus told the disciples, how long must I be with you? God knows that sometimes we can really like 
He has said this all through the whole Bible over and over again. But it's up to us to pick these systems mm -hmm. and then now study and say, now because I'm thinking I'm, I need to do a search and see how many times I'm seeing this. Uh -huh. And yeah. so know that I am the Lord. Yeah. Because it's coming up too many times. Yeah. What is he saying? Mm -hmm. He's saying that you need to know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I am God. There's I am God. God. There's no other God. There is, or me or after me. I am God. Exactly. He'll say that I am the Holy One. I'm the only one. And this, yeah, and people still want to chase after false gods. And that's probably why he's like, he knows. Exactly. Come on, sister. Yeah, exactly. But he's proving himself because he is active and he's giving you assurance. Man, just think about those people that raised out of the tomb, the rock broke, raised out of the tomb. Coming back to man, we haven't even seen nothing like that. Man, for real. And then coming back, and he's like, I thought you were going, but then you have a what if they had a prophetic word? I come to tell you that Jesus has risen. You know, what if they said something like that? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, no more CA. What if they just come like I just want to let you know? Because remember, I'm thinking back when uh, Amari got the Holy Ghost. I'm thinking back even when Brother Juan got the Holy Ghost. I remember when that Brother Juan got the Holy Ghost, we were sitting in the room. And you know, he started talking. I said, Brother, let's go in the room. He started talking, listening, he started speaking. And then, next thing you know, the Lord was prophesying through him, right? And manifest a prophecy out of that brother. The same thing happened when Amari was got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was sick there, he was praise dancing. Next thing you know, he came to me and Janine and had a word, and we was like about to start crying, right? Because it was a prophetic word. So, then think about it these people are coming from the grave, they were asleep. They may have a prophetic word to tell you. In the, and, and, and when Moses elected his leaders, they came and they had a prophetic word. They all prophesied. Because the Spirit of God had empowered them to speak a word. Hey, not Mosia, to speak a word. Not from their home, but from God themself, himself. So what would it be? It shows you. His mighty acts uh -huh. on the day of Pentecost. They spoke in another language. It shows you his mighty acts of who he is. Amen. Assurance is based upon the certainty of God's word. John 17, 8 says, For I have given the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know the truth that I came from you. <laughs> And they have believed that you sent me. First John 5, 9 and 10, it says, if we, receive this, if, we receive, if we receive the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he was born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. Assurance because God's oath. So when God desires to show more conceivably to the hearers of the promise, excuse me, of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guarantees it with an oath. Assurance because of God's promise. I like this Joshua one. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Romans picks it up. No unbelief made in him wavers concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith and has gave God he gave glory to God, fully conceived that God was able. Oh, excuse me, yeah, fully convinced. Sorry, thank you. Fully convinced that God was able to do what He had promised. Come on now, the breath, the breath of life. The imagery of breath is often used to convey spiritual essence and power unseen, except in its effects. Including the aspects of the personal work 
of, not the, I'm going to describe the person now, but of the power of the God, of the Holy Spirit. I forgot to describe the person because sometimes, you know, they have a different view on that. Um, but the main Hebrew and Greek word translated as breath in the NIV is also translated as spirit and wind. So life imparted by God. We understand in Genesis 2 and 7, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Right? So this is life being imparted. Life recalled by his sovereign will. Ecclesiastes 12 and 7. And dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Y'all had a little connection there. A symbol of the power of the spirit. John 20, 21 and 22 says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 37 and 5 says, This says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. live. This is the symbol of his spirit being active. Mm -hmm. 3714, Ezekiel, it says, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. We already read this, and I will place you in your own land. Right? And then you should know that I am the Lord. Right? It's again. Symbol. Right? The breath has, his breath has a different attributes. God's creative, God's creative breath. Psalms 33 and 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hopes. God's enlightening breath. But it is the spirit of man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. God's regenerating breath. He, he saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. God's regenerating breath. He regenerated us. His breath brings us back to life. Mm -hmm. God's empowering breath. We know this, the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of the fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God's empowering breath. What, 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 are, we, what, are, we, what are we seeing now? We're seeing his creative his enlightening, his regeneration, his empowering. We're starting to see a trend here. The breath of God can do some things, right? It can, cre it can create, right? Because he spoke. <laughs> ah, it can create. He spoke on Adam. It created a living soul. He can enlighten, regenerate. He can regenerate you. Um, he can empower you. That's that word, Greek word, dudamus, power, right? I'm empowered, giving you the ability. His breath can also destroy. Second Thessalonians 2 and 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring nothing by the appearance of his coming. I've never, I, as much as I read that, I have not, not picked that out. <laughs> and so I was reading, I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, it, what do you say? Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. Wow. You see what I'm saying? Right. I mean, his breath can destroy. Not only can it give life, it can, it man. But here's, here's, here's another thing. Remember when uh, 
the, the, the two the, the, the husband and wife they lied to Peter. Yeah, and they died right there. When they died right there, he spoke. He didn't do anything, and they and they just they just fell out. It just man. Human experience of rejection. Now, I'm not gonna read the synopsis because we really understand about rejection. This this really now speaks to the children of Israel and how they felt. They felt rejected. Why did they feel rejected? Why did they feel rejected? Question. Anybody know why the children of Israel felt rejected? Because they were um like a byword that become the scorn and reproach yeah. of, and he said, "I will make you a byword, mm -hmm. and I will send you to nations that you in a land of the strangers' land." Right, but what was the what was the reason why all of that happened? Because they um, committed whoredom and started serving false deities and right, so that idols. right, so now. They feel rejected now because they feel because they were kicked out of their own land that their God doesn't love them. Right? Years and years and years of years of being beaten up, feeling left, feeling left out. Why are we not getting blessed? Then then they start trying to be like other nations to and start serving their God to try to feel connected because they feel disconnected from their God. But it's not God's fault that they're disconnected it's their fault because they started serving other gods and he told them time after time after time but they feel rejected because they feel entitled because they live in a land that was promised to them that he must honor his oath which he did honor because he brought them there but he also told them while i'm taking you here you don't do these things but this is focused on being rejection they feel rejection the feeling of a national rejection, Psalm 74 and 1. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? It's a whooping. It's a whooping. Ezekiel 37 11 tells us. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Isaiah says, But Zion says, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. We have just proven in the text. He didn't forget them. He said, I would never leave you. I wouldn't forsake you. He can't, he can't, he is a man that cannot lie. He can't lie. He can't go back on his word. But he set things up. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the human experience, it's not God's experience. Is the human factor that because things don't always go my way, I don't feel rejected. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the reason why I'm in what I'm in is not because of God or all the time, it's because of me. Mm -hmm. What did I do to cause myself, number one, to feel this way or live this way or have these issues coming into my life? Yeah. It was something that I did when I started going back in my mind. Right. Hmm. Saying, oh, why have you cut me off? You never tend, we tend to do that a lot. We do. We have a tendency to do no, that. No, you actually, this it, is what you call. This, this is what you call. But we do this why? Because we want to blame it on somebody we else. We don't want to take they blame each other. We don't want to take responsibility. Okay. So feelings of personal rejection. How long, oh Lord, will you forgive me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? It depends on when you're going to change. Sometimes, right? So we have a nation that was going to reject it, and this speaks to an individual rejection. And these are questions that we ask today. Uh, oh Lord, how long? Will you forgive me forever? Because sometimes we feel like God has forgotten us. But then we have to go back. I was just talking to a friend of mine. He was like, man, I had to just go on the fast. I just had to block some things out because I had to get some things right within myself. Right? Because maybe you need to just stop doing what you're doing and then regroup and figure out what's going on with you. 
But this is how the children of Israel feel. These are how people feel today. We have to understand that we have to tie close to God. We 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 we're gonna we're gonna have the ups and downs in our life. But if you, you know what, it's a part. Of, it's a part of life. It's a part of life. But we can't we 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 can't take that as like man. God has left me because He didn't leave me. That's a trick of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Saying that God has left you. Yeah, he's in it, man. God is left. You might as well go sin. You might as well go, go back to the streets. You might as well drink. You might as well do whatever. Some people actually listen to that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they go to the parable of the seeds that fell by the wayside, and some fell on stony ground mm -hmm. and didn't take root. Give me a give me, give me fist. Give me a fist on that one. Go ahead. <laughs> wow. 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 But that's what we split the, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But if scripture tells us that he hasn't left us, that's what we hold on to, that he didn't leave us. But he's doing this because he loves us. How many times do you hear that when you're going, uh, uh, I'm whooping you because I love you? Mm -hmm. And my dad hears us put a like button on that because he didn't done it too to me. <laughs> you know, I'm whooping you because I love you. It's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I didn't hurt that. I know some of y'all have heard that rap. You know, but it's it's for your own good. Because you you went out of line. Now I got to I gotta I gotta reel you back in. How do I reel you back in if I stop doing for you? <laughs> Once I stop doing, <laughs> God. <laughs> you know, you start singing that song, I'm running back to you. <laughs> I see you standing there. <laughs> So then we see the text that the, Jesus the Christ as servant, as a, being a servant mode. Ezekiel 37, 24, 25 says, I'm going to read 25. He says that they shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Peace. We talk about peace. Talk about peace. So we're seeing here, and, and then the uh, the prophet speaks of the Messiah as a servant. That's the title of this. Matthew talks about um, Jesus being uh, the fulfilling and being uh, the servant, right? So he's not only the 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 servant. Verse eighteen says, "Behold, my servant, who I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased." I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He's talking about the Messiah, Emmanuel. We also see, and then he describes himself in Luke. For who is greater, one who declares the table or one who serves? It is not the one who uh, reclines at the table, but I am among you as the ones who the one who serves. Matthew 20, 28. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. He worked. He came to serve. Also, he is a shepherd. Right? The prophecies about the shepherd, uh, about the Messiah being a shepherd. Ezekiel 34, 23 says, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Jesus Christ shepherd his flock. Luke uh, 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Uh, he is the risen shepherd. Revelation 7 and 17. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them and guide them to spring of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. He is the shepherd. The good shepherd. We talked about that. John 10. He is the good shepherd. And then I'm ending on this. The renewal of God's people. The transformation by God of the lives of his people, whether corporately or individually, leading to recover the lost vitality and purity. Individual renewal. Oh, we like this one. 
even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men so far exhausted, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hey. This is individual renewal. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24 says, To put off your old self, which becomes to your former manner of life and is corrupt through de deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. God is doing a transformation. In Ezekiel, he showed Ezekiel the transformation. It's a type of resurrection. They've been died. It's a type of, it could be. Consider the type of baptism, right? Being died to the old self. Then coming up a new creature, creature, creature in the things of God, right? It's a it's a new, he's, he keeps saying new. 36, I will give you a new, new spirit, new heart. I'm renewing. To Romans 12, what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? I'm renewing something in you. I'm renewing, I'm regenerating you too. The factory setting that you should be. Ezekiel tells you that you were created out of the likeness of God. So he tells you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your thoughts, desires, and emotions need to be renewed in the things of God. Put on the new stuff. Put on the new coat. The coat of the spirit of God. And be out of the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Then we have corporate renewal. This is Ezekiel 37, when we just talked about 1 through 14. But Joel 228, 228 to 32 says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days. I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens, on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, among the survivors shall be those who the Lord calls. This is a corporate renewal. That's it. Oh, yeah. That, that's it. You guys can read that later. But we're looking at a corporate renewal. A corporate renewal. He's uniting. It's, a, it's the power of one body. God is not, you know, he's not happy with the separation of every, well, if you don't do it this way, then it ain't right. If you don't do it this way, then it ain't right. What about doing it God's way? Right. Do it the Bible way. Man. This, if you don't do it this way, then you're going to hell. If you don't do it this way, you're going to hell. We fight over days to worship God. We fight over this and that. Mm -hmm. Right? He's saying that we need to come together and be unified. Come to the unity of faith. Be together. Be unified. Hey, I talked about that too in, in um, Go ahead. I'm going offline. This is our talk. In Acts 2, after um, the day of Pentecost, when everybody was filled with the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and stuff, and then after he was like, you know, everybody come together, pull the pot, put all of your assets together, everybody will eat, nobody will have to go without, you know, so everybody